Yeah, we have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so yeah, so this this talk is kind of an overview of a lot of different things that I've been involved in with the kind of core theme of of fever and uh, antibiotic use and illnesses outside of malaria and kind of how to differentiate those in low resource settings. So I'm happy, like, like she said, to answer any questions about any of these projects or other stuff that I've done or kind of how, how I've come upon my, my journey to my global health work. Um, so just, oh, that was on there. That was probably as good as it gets, okay. Um, so just an overview. So we're going to talk about a couple of scenarios, just kind of to set the scene here, and then go over some some things about antibiotic use and resource limited settings, review the current guidelines for the diagnosis of febrile illness, and then some challenges in managing these acute illnesses in low middle income countries, and then talk about a QI project that I'm involved with, and then some other kind of just future directions, things related to this kind of where this is going. Okay, so the first scenario might be familiar to a lot of you. So this is a kid in an urgent care in San Francisco. It's a four-year-old. He's healthy, vaccinated. He comes in with a chief complaint of fever. Has had four days of fever, maybe some runny nose, abdominal pain. Is still drinking okay, maintaining his urine output. Has decent looking vitals. Does have a temp when he's there. The exam is pretty unremarkable. So this is kind of probably like 90% of the kids you see in, in urgent care, even in the emergency department. Now we change the scenario. Now we're working in Embrara, Uganda. We have pretty much the same kid, um, also here with four days of fever and looking good. But you probably know your differential is probably a lot different here, right? So compared to you know what we see here domestically with the same scenario abroad, you have way more things to consider, including malaria, right? But then also typhoid, we have dengue, we have Lots of different things, um, other bacterial illnesses, like the, the, the scenario is a lot different despite the kids looking pretty much the same. Um, and so, and then what you're going to do to manage this kid is probably going to be a bit different too. So we'll talk about that. So starting with malaria testing. Um, so since, since 2010, the WHO has recommended testing all febrile children before treating them for malaria. So we used to just kind of assume and then just treat everybody. But um, since this recommendation came out, um, it's turned to test, treat, track. So you're supposed to test first and then treat if they're positive and then track who we're treating, who's positive, et cetera, and start to kind of learn more about the epidemiology of, of malaria in these settings. But there's still a decent amount of variation in how providers are doing this. Um, and then outside of malaria, how they're managing febrile illness. And so this is some pretty early data from like 2010-ish around when this recommendation came out. And at that time, it showed that testing was still not great. So the black, the black bars are tested children and untested. And you can see even in hospitals um, and in formal medical settings, the majority of patients still weren't getting tested, but this is getting better. Um, but there's still a lot of difficulty distinguishing bacterial versus viral. There's no test for that. There aren't really um, antibiotics or sometimes not available or at least specific antibiotics. Um, so there's still a lot of issues with availability and then guidelines in general, just there's poorly adhered to, and we'll talk more about what those guidelines are. And then uh, a lot of children who have negative malaria testing are still being treated, which in some cases follows the recommendations. Um, if kids present severely ill, sometimes you're still supposed to treat them if, if their malaria test is negative, but there's a lot of cases where that's still not true and people are still kind of giving malaria treatment because it's like, well, this still kind of looks like malaria and we don't really know what else it is, so we're just going to do this anyways. So this is more recent data. So this is from, I think this was published in 2020. And so um, this is showing antibiotic use. And basically in low middle income countries, rates of antibiotic use are super high. So up to 95%, um, especially in respiratory infections, which is basically these blue bars, and you can see there's a bunch of countries here that were part of this study, um, that the majority of these countries have rates over 80%. Um, and then even in diarrheal illness, uh, there's a lot of antibiotic use, and then even these kids who were malaria positive, still a good, a good percentage of them also received antibiotics. Um, and then, you know, another reason for high rates of antibiotic use are 
fact that these systems, most, most systems in low middle income countries are pluralistic, which means that there's many ways of getting access to healthcare and medications, including what we would consider informal healthcare. So like drug shops, um, traditional healers, people selling things on the street, uh, there's private hospitals, also public hospitals, a lot of ways to get antibiotics without a formal prescription. And then we're also starting to see a lot of resistance in these environments. So this is not well studied because the microbiology capacity in a lot of these settings is not very good, but where we're starting to improve that and actually starting to track things, we're seeing that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing resistance, including MPROs, ESL, MRSA, like all the things we're starting to see here as well, um, which is concerning. And so one of the projects that I was involved with as a resident was in Kenya. And this was a, a large study looking primarily at several children that were undifferentiated to study arboviral diseases. But we also looked at the clinical management of these children and antibiotic use and how clinicians were prescribing. And what we found was that, um, so these are the four sites. So they were mostly on the, on the lake, on the lake side, and then uh, on the coast here. So areas where there's high malaria endemicity. And um, there were different uh, levels of healthcare. So there was like an outpatient side and an inpatient side on, in both settings. Um, and so what we saw was that the patients that were most, most likely to get antibiotics were younger patients, so children under four, and those who had upper respiratory signs on their exam, if they had a flush toilet in the house, which we think is probably a proxy for higher socioeconomic status. And then the biggest predictor was that fewer malaria test negative. So if you didn't have malaria, most of the kids got antibiotics, which basically translated to everybody. <laughs> And so, so going back to the guidelines, so the current guidelines that most places use, or at least have some kind of derivation from, is IMCI, which is the WHO's Integrated Management of Childhood Illness. And so some of you might be familiar with these already, but they're, you know, they're pretty ubiquitous in, in a lot of these settings and a lot of places have those posters on the wall, that kind of thing. But they kind of go through like stepwise. So first they ask about danger signs and, you know, does the, is the child able to take fluid, are they having seizures, are they lethargic or unconscious? And then if they look bad, if you're in you know, a lower level healthcare center, you're supposed to refer them to a higher level of care. So it kind of stops there. If it's, if it's you know, if these are negative and you're kind of continuing your assessment then you start to ask about their symptoms and their thoughts and people breathing, et cetera, et cetera, kind of how you normally assess a patient, but very guided and stepwise, because a lot of times in these lower level health centers, especially you're not, this isn't a physician who's doing this, it's like a clinical officer, sometimes even a nurse. So it's tailored to people who may have had less medical training and not as much training in kind of creating a differential and formulating an assessment. So the guidelines keep going. Um, so it asks, you know, do they have fever? Um, what's the malaria risk? How long has the fever lasted? Do they have any other symptoms? Have signs of meningitis, do they have signs of measles, kind of a few specific illnesses, um, and then continues down from there. And then it kind of gets into this like chart of kind of what to do with, with fever with febrile patients. So if they have danger signs or a stiff neck, if this is severe febrile illness, you should treat them for malaria anyways, you should give them an antibiotic. Like basically you're treating them for sepsis, you're sending them to a referral hospital. If they have malaria, but they look okay, um, then you treat them. Uh, and then if they have uh, symptoms of pneumonia, you give them antibiotics and then have them follow up. This is like kind of middle, like they can maybe go home. And then there's this bottom group where it's kind of like, we don't know, tell them to come back. You know, we're not sure, but give them some Tylenol, which you can see here works. You know, we do that with a lot of patients where we just kind of presume this is a viral illness. But in this setting, it's a little trickier. So in the same study in Kenya, we did a qualitative study along with this and kind of talked to the providers who are seeing these children and asked them, you know, like, what, what kind of guides when you decide to give antibiotics or not. And so you can see, like, you know, this is talking about what symptoms they have. And they say, like, this sounds good in practice. But what they're saying is that, you know, we, we use antibiotics a lot. And if there's not really another cause of fever, the IMCI doesn't really help you. So if it's like not measles, not malaria, and then it's kind of just like this pool of stuff, like maybe it's URI, whatever, like they don't really 
help you any more than that or get more specific and then they don't have tests for that either. And then the part about like just giving them paracetamol and having them follow up most of these providers said they're not really comfortable doing that because a lot of these children come in super sick already and they don't really feel like sending them out that they're going to get be able to get back to care in time and that there would be enough time to really help them. And so a lot of them said that they just give antibiotics prophylactically because they're worried that these kids are going to get worse and they don't really have any way to predict who is or isn't going to. So they just kind of give antibiotics to everyone hoping that you know, they will go home and, and not get worse and you know, not be able to come back. So you can see that there's just a lot of dilemmas in how to diagnose these patients. So there's tons of overlap in symptoms. So like in the Kenya study, we were trying to include patients that were undifferentiated and they tried to exclude kids who had obvious vocal symptoms like skin infections, et cetera. But we found that really we couldn't exclude anybody because there's just so much overlap in patients with, you know, dengue symptoms, malaria symptoms, pneumonia symptoms, like you can come in in like severe respiratory distress with severe malaria, you know, it's just, there's just so much overlap and then there really aren't any diagnostics. So most of these places have malaria rapid tests. Um, some of them have, most of them, I guess, would have HIV rapid tests, hemoglobin, and sometimes that's about it. Sometimes they have urinalysis, but most of them don't have like an actual lab. Even the ones that do have a lab in the facility don't really send labs in patients that aren't going to be admitted or kind of well appearing overall because they take so long to come back. So even if you can get a CDC, it's not going to be there in a timely enough manner to kind of help your help guide your management in the emergency setting. And then, like I said, there's just a lack of a lot of medications. So a lot of times people are just using what's there, whether it's the right choice or not, and supplies. And then training, like I said, a lot of these are lower level providers who may have not had as extensive of background with uh, medical decision making and all of that. Plus, a lot of them don't really have any specific training for pediatrics. Some do, but a lot do not. Um, and then, you know, there's just very high volumes in these clinics. Um, there's health worker shortages. A lot of times there's strikes and people protesting and that kind of thing because they haven't got paid. So they're just seeing like tons of patients at a time. So they don't really have a lot of time to spend with like education or return precautions or that kind of thing. And then the last thing is that we really don't know the actual prevalence of severe bacterial illnesses in these settings, because again, you know, microbiology capacity, all that stuff is very limited. So we don't actually know the starting point, like what's the likelihood kind of the positive predictive value that these kids are going to have a severe bacterial illness. So super easy stuff. Um, so the WHO has kind of uh, moved towards promoting antibiotic stewardship or antimicrobial stewardship in these settings and came up with this global action plan. They have a toolkit now that you can download. It's like this big booklet of um, specifically like setting up antimicrobial stewardship programs in LMICs. And then they also have this aware classification of antibiotics, which groups antibiotics into three categories. And then as part of this, there's a specific component in healthcare facilities and it talks about you know, all these things you need to do. And one of them is to have dedicated financial support for healthcare facilities to create an, an antimicrobial stewardship action plan, which you can see is probably a huge problem in a lot of these countries just because there isn't a, a ton of money just to like move around. So how do we do this in these settings without having a huge pot of money to just kind of start dedicating to antimicrobial stewardship? And so from the work that I've done and the project we have in Tanzania, and also the work in Kenya, we're mostly focusing like this is the chain of, of kind of how antibiotics get out to being used. And you can see that there's a lot of places with potential areas for intervention, but the main thing we focus on is here. So prescribing, so actually getting antibiotics to people from the health center. And so the project in Tanzania is, is super early right now, but we're working at Mohambili uh, National Hospital, which is also where Teresa works, and that's in Dar es Salaam, and that's a pretty big hospital, so it's a referral center. It's got pretty high level of care. They have ventilators. They have a lot of resources compared to some of these other health centers, um, and we have only have a couple months. We're starting to track antibiotic use, and what we're seeing is that you know about a third of patients who are admitted from the emergency department get IV antibiotics, and then 90% of kids who get antibiotics in the emergency department are getting like IV antibiotics are getting ceftriaxone. Um, and that's for 
a bunch of indication, but mostly the, the most common indications are lower respiratory tract infections and the prophylaxis. And prophylaxis includes a lot of different things, but a lot of these patients are trauma patients. A lot are just patients with complex medical conditions, so patients that come in in like DKA or renal failure, they'll just give them staph reaction just in case, and then oncology patients. And so the, the QI project has kind of four, four main areas of intervention. Um, so the first one is tracking antibiotics. So that's kind of what I was talking about in the last slide. So actually looking at what they're prescribing and for what indication, and then also looking at route and dosing and if it's appropriate for the child's weight and that kind of thing. Um, and then we're looking at microbiology data, data. So we're taking, they have a separate grant to increase their microbiology capacity and we're starting to track that and actually uh, actually create a database of, of um, cultures and sensitivities for both blood and urine samples. And then from there, create an antibiogram that's specific to the site for pediatrics. And then um, we've created an antimicrobial stewardship committee. And then they're starting to do ward rounds I think twice a week with the pharmacist on the pediatric ward. And then the last portion is education. So working on uh, lectures and training for the residents and the staff. Um, also creating some like posters and education material that are going to be hanging in the emergency department, both kind of provider facing, but also more patient facing. Um, so we're kind of in the process of doing those things. And so this is a lot of things and a lot of different components. And so we have, we have a pretty big team. <laughs> so we have uh, microbiologists involved, there's pharmacists, there's pediatric emergency doctors, there's pediatric physicians, including like other subspecialties like ID and gynecology or pharmacist committee, um, general emergency physicians, we have trainees, uh, we have residents uh, and also medical students and then also other staff members. Um, and then this is part of Movenbilly National Hospital, but also we have people on the Oakland and the San Francisco side here. And then Movenbilly works very closely with the MUHAS, which is the university there, which includes all the trainees and all of the um, teaching faculty. So back to our scenario. So let's say your patient in Uganda is, is malaria negative, HIV negative. They, leave, they live four hours away. So now we're kind of back to the same question. What do we do now? Like, do we assume this is a viral illness? Do we watch and wait? So kind of the next thing that I'm interested in is, you know, how do we, how do we make guidelines for this better? And so that includes a few different things. So we can revise the guidelines. We can add in maybe extra tests, like accessible testing, uh, point of care testing, um, maybe other tools that aren't as readily available, like full socks, and then also including a component of you know, who gets followed up when and can we improve that process. So we'll talk about kind of a few things, a few projects that people are doing um, that look at all of these different ways of intervening or kind of changing the guidelines. So one is adding pulse oximetry. So um, this was actually done by one of our UCSF faculty, Kim Balto. So she did a study in mobile clinics in Malawi, and all they did was add a pulse ox to MCI, and they found that they decreased odds of antibiotic prescription by seven. So like dramatically dropped um, how comfortable patients were not prescribing to, not prescribing antibiotics primarily to respiratory patients if they had a normal pulse oximetry, um, and then increased their frequency of, of diagnosing just the cold and not necessarily pneumonia. Um, one issue with this study was that there wasn't a lot of follow-up, so we're, you know, we're not sure if we missed anyone super important, but I think overall it seemed like no, like most patients that had a two week follow up were, were fine. So we don't think that there was like a, a, a big negative impact of doing this. And then this study talks about prediction rules. So they took a cohort of patients, I think in Tanzania, and applied a bunch of different guidelines to the population where they had a known diagnosis. So they did like viral testing, they did bacterial testing and all of this to, to diagnose them. And then they applied all these different guidelines to see how well they would actually diagnose what type of illness they had. And what we found is that, um, or what they found, sorry, not me, I was involved in this, but <laughs> what they found was that all of these, all of these guidelines or all of these different uh, prediction rules are not very good at diagnosing illness correctly. So the pink, the big pink circles are who got antibiotics. The blue circles are, are like the validated bacterial infections that were missed. And then the purple is where they overlap. So you can see that there's a ton of patients who get antibiotics that didn't necessarily have a validated infection. And then this little overlap area is pretty small in a lot of these studies. And it just depends on 
on which rule that they're using. Like I think a couple of these, like this one includes CRP. Um, this one we'll talk about a little bit more, but it includes a couple other tests, and then a lot of them are just kind of clinical rules. Like, this one, the AAP has like CBC as part of it and your analysis, but but none of them are great. And then these are just the types of cases that were missed. So uh, kind of a smattering of things, but a lot of typhoid that was missed, um, some intracellular infections. Uh, most of them have at least a little chunk of patients with bacteremia and then some cases of pneumonia, and then a lot of UTIs, especially for the ones that don't include your analysis. And so this study in particular, Almanac, which was done in Tanzania, they just added urinalysis and typhoid to a revised uh, IMCI guideline. And then they also made it an electronic system and found that that was very helpful. So decreased diagnosis of pneumonia and UTI, and they're actually testing decreased antibiotic use from 84 to 15%, and then also had better clinical outcomes in seven days despite reducing antibiotics, which is you know, obviously a good, a good thing. And this is just kind of an uh, offshoot of that. So then they also kept those same guidelines and then added in uh, CRP to differentiate patients with, uh, with basically no other kind of specific symptoms. And then this just kind of shows what their little system looks like. So you like check off what symptoms they have and then like put it in the and it kind of spits out like this is what you treat them with, this is the dose. And then, uh, which is really nice, especially for providers who may have you know less familiarity with like prescribing for pediatric patients and that kind of thing. And so similarly, they had even better results. Um, so they showed that. So this is the EPCOT and this is the the almanac. So the EPOC showed that the percents went down even further if we got antibiotics um, down to eleven point five total, and that their clinical failure rates were only four percent. So they tracked people after they, uh, the children after they went home and found that only 4% of them needed antibiotics later, which is pretty good. And these were done in, uh, in smaller clinics. Um, so finally, like another aspect of this is improving follow-up care. And I'm not gonna get into this too much because the person who is the, the head of the study is actually giving a talk. Um, but, but basically his whole focus and one of the projects I'm involved with is looking at patients who are discharged from the hospital and kind of improving follow-up care for them, improving education, uh, linking them back so that they don't have to be readmitted or die after discharge. So it has a bunch of components. One is a risk prediction model and then um, education and counseling and then setting them up with follow-up care. And they're seeing that this is really effective, that more people are coming back to care after discharge and that there are much many fewer deaths in the months after discharge. So Matt's talk is on the 23rd and you should go because he's awesome and this project is really cool. So I'm not going to talk about it much more, but they're they're expanding. It's been very successful. It started with five years and they did a smaller cohort. Now they're actually trying to do an older cohort from five to twelve because the effects have been so remarkable. So back to our patient. So let's say you have these other labs. Now you have this hemoglobin, you have a pulse ox, you have a CRP, you have a procalcitonin, you don't really have any other localizing symptoms. So maybe now you feel a little more comfortable sending this kid home. Maybe you have some sort of way of setting up a follow-up for him. So putting it all together, some, some kind of ways we can approach this. I think one is prediction models, which kind of gets into the smart, smart discharges in some of these studies. Um, and then incorporating those, creating new guidelines, training people specifically to evaluate pediatric patients, using point of care testing, and then also follow-up care and kind of stratifying patients for who needs more intensive follow-up care to create risk stratified algorithms for management and follow-up. So how do we make this happen? So I think, you know, creating training and guidelines, ensuring that follow-up is available. Um, so using community health workers, phone calls, education, improving access to health centers, um, access to diagnostic testing and equipment, doing more research, so prediction studies, um, evaluating these algorithms, also tracking bacterial pathogens, resistance patterns, and then creating tailored guidelines by epidemiology and resources, because IMCI right now is kind of one size fits all, and we know that's not really true, even domestically, but also in other countries, the ethnicity of certain pathogens is very different in different places. And then taking this a step further, I just included this too, because 
I think there's a lot of other you know, down kind of upstream from this community education, engaging people, um, more public health campaigns surrounding antibiotic use and awareness. Um, community health workers, I think are super important and linking people to care, but also in, in disseminating information. And then we mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but informal care providers. Um, so traditional healers, which is what this picture is of, with like a, like a drug repository, one of the traditional healers, like a bunch of herbal medications and then drug shops. So kind of other places where patients are going to get antibiotics and how to kind of help prescribe those appropriately or not give them to patients or, you know, regulate that a little bit better. And then I'm sure there's other things you guys might have ideas, but, you know, other places where we can try to tackle this, this issue. So that is all I have. Um, these are some, some of the references we talked about. And then I'm happy to, to answer questions or discuss all of this. Um, wanted to, to thank the people who are working on this on the ground, a lot of our partners internationally that are seeing these patients every day. Um, does anyone in the room have a question? And then you can also check the, the chat too. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about solutions at the end of the presentation. And I was wondering in like the cascade of different reasons why people might not get the care they need, whether it's, you know they're too far to go to the actual location, the clinic doesn't have a diagnostic tool, the person isn't trained, or the guidelines are unclear. Where do you think the investment would have the most impact if you had to choose one of the pieces of the cascade where people are getting missed or dropped out in terms of getting the right care that we would invest in to, to resolve or improve? Can I ask you just to read a question? Yeah, um, so, so the question was kind of along the cascade of, of access to care or staffing or resources. Um, you know, what, what, would be, what would be kind of the, highest impact place to intervene to to improve um, care or improve appropriate antibiotic use in the setting? I think that's a hard question because I, I really don't think that one thing would fix this. Um, and there's lots of different different issues on each of those levels. So like access to care isn't necessarily just is there a healthcare center nearby or not, but it's like transportation, you know, like a lot of these places will have a care center that's not geographically that far, but it's like on a dirt road and you have to like, you know, get a motorcycle or get a bus or, you know, whatever. Um, and then a lot of people also have a great amount of difficulty leaving their home. And so even patients who don't work, um, like when we talk to providers and um, I did a different study uh, looking at traditional healers and accessing traditional healers for care, um, in Uganda and a lot of patients there talked about how they go to the traditional healer because it's just a lot easier to get there um, because they're like in the community or they can like find them like they'll come to them or you know whatever so I think that that's that's a huge factor but I think you know they also need to be able to get the appropriate care once they're there so like patients that go to healers sometimes have malaria or have different things that then get missed and then are very sick when they arrive at the actual health center. And then, you know, if they make it to a smaller, like a lower level health center, they often still need to be referred to a higher level health center and then they have to get there. And so I think like that's, that's a major issue. Um, but I think outside of that, like the facilities that they're going to also have to be able to treat them and treat them appropriately. So I don't know that I have an answer to that question. I think, um, yeah, it's just a super complicated problem. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of a lot of these things are gonna have to change before we see everyone kind of getting the care that they're that they need to get. There's a couple of things in the chat from Michelle. If you want to ask Michelle to come up with a chance question. Sure. I don't know if I see can I Oh yeah, hi. Can you all see or hear me? Yeah, you. Okay. Hi, Michelle Shang. Um, I'm a faculty in PEDS and EPI. Uh, thanks for this talk. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, just on that, I have a separate comment, but kind of on that last discussion, 
Um, I think there's, it's like two sides, right? It's uh, catching kids who are really sick and making sure that they get the right care, but also not over prescribing antimicrobials. Um, so I think like finding those really sick kids is, is really important. Um, but on, on the, in terms of sort of stewardship, in terms of like uh, not over prescribing antimicrobials, I know from Valerie Dacremont's experience with the EPOCT that um, it seemed like having that electronic tool and doing that in front of the, cause you're in, unless you have like a ton of point of care diagnostics and you say, oh, you don't have COVID, you don't have RSV, you don't have whatever, I don't know, like we might get to that point where we have like some point of care is to look for a lot of different viral infections, but I think it's going to take a while to get there. And in the meantime, um, one thing Valerie said from that EPOC tool was that just having that tablet and going through it and, 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 and showing that, you know, your child most likely has a viral infection that doesn't require antibiotics, that was like reassuring to the family. So I think something that like reassures the family that they don't need antibiotics is, is, re is, is, is really key. Um, just on a separate note, um, I'm really interested in, uh, um, you know, whether or not a lot of these kids actually still have malaria contributing to their illness, because in some of these same study sites, a large proportion of them will be PCR positive, but RDT negative for malaria. And um, the general kind of uh, feeling is that, well, the, that malaria was an incidental finding. They're actually sick with something else and they don't need treatment for that malaria. Uh, but I think a lot of that is just based on the limits of detection of our available diagnostics. So we currently have um, an NIH funded study in Tanzania, it's gonna be in Bagamoyo, where we're going to have um, kids that present with fever and some get treatment based on PCR results and some just the RDT. And later on, we'll, we'll be able to see like what proportion actually had like um, low level malaria that was missed by the RDT. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens with these kids over, we, it's, it's a longitudinal cohort where we're following the kids for a couple of years. Um, and we have some preliminary data to suggest that if you clear this low level malaria, that kids actually get fewer febrile illnesses over time. This is from a low transmission setting in Uganda. Um, Paul Krasinowski, he was the first author of the paper that was published last year. Um, so we think that if you clear this low level malaria that was missed by RDT, um, it can Im probably improve like just uh, their overall health and their ability to you know, fight off viral infections. Um, so that's just an aside, I'd love to talk more separately, but uh, I, I'm also interested in this question of like, you know, malaria that might be missed by the RDTs. So that's a good point. And the study that I worked on in Kenya, part of that study, there was a like a well cohort where they went out into the community and actually blood tested patients mm -hmm. to find out uh, like chikungunya, primarily chikungunya and dengue endemicity, but they also tested them for malaria. And there's like a big subset of kids who are like running around healthy that will have like, they were doing blood smears, but like, you know, one plus, like they would have a, you know, some level of parasitemia, but would be, you know, well clinically, like they were in the, the non-symptomatic cohort. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a similar question. Like, you know, there's, there's this group of kids who's like running around with low levels of malaria all the time. And like, do we, do we treat them? And then, you know, there's the, the people that are doing like the prophylactic, like just going around and kind of routinely dosing and saying that, mm -hmm. that that might be effective, but we just don't have, I think, the resources at this point, but we know it works. Like, yeah. treat a bunch of people, like their health, their health, um, like the child's, the overall health improves and, you know, you have less level, less, less anemia and that kind of thing, but it's just, I think at this point, like no one's been able to convince these big funding groups, like, hey, let's just go give everyone malaria treatment intermittently and kind of treat it more like a preventative, preventative thing, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think some of it is just the, also there's just not the resources right to do you can either just treat presumptively or you could look and do like a PCR but like the resources aren't there to do these highly sensitive testing um but you know maybe that will change in the future you know in the same way that COVID molecular testing is more available and um we're also, I mean, we're not great at this here either. Like in the emergency department, we oftentimes just give people a bunch of antibiotics, treating them presumptively for sepsis. And we can be a little more judicious than who we decide to do that on because you know, we pick patients who are more severely ill because we're our likelihood of missing severe illness and patients who are well or have you know good looking vitals, et cetera, here is lower than, than what it might be in, in these settings. But we still, even in the cohort that's sick, like we still don't have a test that tells us like it's this bacterial is it's viral and you know the microbiology studies and even the PCR tests that we can do don't have that rapid of turnaround where we can actually test them before we give them like broad spectrum antibiotics. So this isn't something unique to yeah, definitely countries and like Teresa was like, <laughs> alluding very much into what Teresa's studying. So yeah. Um, there's a question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a two-part question. One. Uh, have any of those studies that with all those acronyms yeah. um, looked at, I guess, those, the feasibility and utility of radiographic data to modulate their suspicion of disease processes that might need antibiotics? Yeah, so the question was if these studies have looked at um, radiographic data in predicting, um, and you mean like x-ray specifically yeah. or? Yeah. Something that seems on surface like a, a thing that could be implemented in some places. That... Yeah, so so they haven't really because in a lot of these places, x-rays aren't available routinely. There are some studies on that and there's some domestically, like there's uh, part of like some of the people involved in PCAR and those groups have like specifically taught for and have a lot of studies on like CRP and procalcitonin and predicting pneumonia, and, um, like severe pneumonia, et cetera. Um, and then radiographically proven or not. But we also know that the x-rays are not, like there's no gold, there's no great gold standard for bacterial pneumonia because x-rays, we, we know we're learning more and more that even x-rays aren't great for that. And then a lot of times when we call something bacterial pneumonia on x-ray, it's actually probably not. Um, so so yeah, so so no is the answer to that because because most of these places, a lot of these like clinics and things don't have x-rays and then the ones that do oftentimes reserve them because they either have to, have the patient pay for them or you know, the cost, or it's hard to kind of get, like it's hard to get like a portable x-ray. So like if you have a sicker patient, they, they don't really have like a great way to get the x-ray there. You have to like take the patient. And sometimes that's the same for ultrasound too. There's people who are studying ultrasound in pneumonia, and especially in these settings, because it's often easier to get an ultrasound probe on a patient. And there is some data that ultrasound can predict bacterial pneumonia or at least higher risk of that. But I think that's also not really that hasn't been incorporated into like a guideline or anything yet. And you know, these guidelines, like specifically Almanac and EPOC were kind of made just tailoring the IMCI and not necessarily like creating a risk stratification model based on epidemiological data because those data aren't really there. So there aren't, a, there aren't really studies kind of going through all of this. So, well, not as many because it's just expensive to do that to like characterize all these pathogens and then kind of go back and say, you know, who's at higher risk of having an actual bacterial infection? Let's make a rule from that, which is kind of one of the things that I'm interested in doing. Uh, it's more of like, here's the rule we already have. How do we fix it and show that we didn't really cause harm from doing that, if that makes sense? We'll say that one of the most ominous signs, though, that repeatedly in different models shows up is um, hypoxia for being um, what, regardless of the cause, at least in terms of trying to identify the children in particular who are at highest risk of a poor outcome and study after study. It. That's one of the risk factors that, I guess, vital signs that continuously pops up. So you might not need something super fancy if you had the right combination of maybe point of care biomarkers, the right symptoms and signs. I don't try to repeat that. For, I don't know if people can hear that, but Teresa was just saying that hypoxia is one of the kind of better predictors of poor outcomes or children who are sicker as far as vital signs and um, 
more or less invasive testing goes. Uh, but yeah, there are, you know, there are some, I think the idea is that we, we probably have we probably have some clinical predictors already that we can put together and kind of give a better, um, what would you call it, like numerical or sort of like risk stratified validated model um, than IMCI, just because that was not necessarily created for that reason. Josh Bryce has her hand raised uh, in the chat. So the models. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question or do I need to put it in the chat? Uh, you can, I don't know if you can hear me, you can definitely ask a question, uh, maybe Josh first and then and then you, Jennifer, if that works. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great, great talk. Um, I had kind of two questions. One is, uh, just as a background, I work in the thrilling world of guidelines. And so my question is, uh, do the guidelines need to be changed or do we need to change the way that guidelines themselves are changed? And then the second question I had was related to these risk models. Something that I see in my own work and guidelines is that people think, oh, if we have this point of care test and they assume that it's static, where there's actually a lot of dynamism in the resources. So can you envision a guideline where I have something today and I don't have it tomorrow? Thanks. Yeah, no, those are both really good points. Um, I, I totally think that the, the way guidelines are are created and refined and used needs to change. And I think I, I think everyone kind of knows that or agrees. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that there's kind of a consensus that the, the WHO is not super dynamic in how they revise these things and change them over time. And it ends up being, I think, after some pressures that they're maybe not working as well before that happens. Um, and then, I mean, it's kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but I think the point of the IMCI guidelines, I think, wasn't necessarily to diagnose specific illnesses. Like they were created to kind of guide people and stratify patients into like different types or kind of boxes, but not necessarily like, you know, this is pharyngitis and you need to treat it and it's probably bacterial or whatnot. Um, so, so yeah, so there, I think there's a lot of, a lot of places to, to intervene and kind of think about that. Um, and then, uh, as far as the second part, um, what, was, what was the second part again? The sort of dynamism around resources, like a oh, guideline yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great point. And I think that these um, like electronic apps and things, I think that's where those are very handy because some of them do that already where you can like say if you have a result or not. And if you have it, it'll kind of go down a certain route. If you don't have it, then it'll go kind of down another route. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why it's so helpful to have things like that, where you're not like just following a flow chart on the wall or kind of doing this in your head. You actually get to like, like there's different branch points and you know, you know way more about this than I do because I've talked to you about this, but um, as far as you know, like when you're programming this, how you have like a point and from that decision point, you know, you go down a different way, depending on what the what the result shows or what what um, testing you have available or even like what clinical signs you have and, and what they show. So I think having having a dynamic tool like that is super important. And you know, ideally I think all of these would come with that sort of system where everyone would have like seeing a patient would have a tablet and be able to use this rather than like a booklet or you know, looking up on the wall. So so again that you know that requires resources too. So I think you know a lot of these studies are trying to prove that and that was kind of the point of one of the points of Almanac and some of the precursors to EPOC was you know having just having the tool kind of um, what I think Michelle was saying just having that tool and having that electronic system in and of itself is is helpful. And then Jennifer, you can go ahead with your question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great talk. Um, I just have two, um, two separate questions. I'm so sorry for doing two at once. Uh, my first question is just around sort of watchful waiting with parents, right? We've done this with like much lower risk conditions like otitis media where we don't prescribe antibiotics, but then sort of empower the family to decide once they leave if they can start those antibiotics or not. I'm wondering just if you've seen studies looking at that or maybe see that as a strategy for addressing like four percent that got missed so it might be challenging for them to get back to a health center and then my second question is just that i would love to hear 
really anyone's thoughts around, I think, antibiotic stewardship in lower resource settings where people have much higher barriers to care can feel much more high risk than antibiotic stewardship at home. Um, and just so how researchers or study designers have thought through how do we ethically promote antibiotic stewardship in places that still have really high child mortality. Yeah, those are really good questions. So I have not seen anyone who's doing like like SNAP prescriptions or giving someone because it's not it's not as easy, I think, since most of these most patients get the antibiotic kind of handed to them at the facility itself. Um, sometimes they have to go out and buy them, but a lot of times, like if they're at a government funded health center, the pharmacy is there. And so they go and get the prescription while they're there. And I think it'd be pretty difficult for them to have to come back and get something. And then there's not really like general, like it's pretty rare that they will write them a script and have them like go out to like a pharmacy in the community to purchase it just because they don't have the funds to do that. And the pharmacies aren't usually like a government funded place where they can just go turn in a paper and get it. They have to get it at the at the government funded health center. So I think that would be kind of a less feasible option, um, but I'm wondering if there's, you know, some other way to do something similar. Um, and that's, and you know, most of the time patients who leave the hospital, uh, it, whether it's emergency or, or for an admission, don't, don't have structured follow-up care. So like that's one of the aspects of smart discharges that's different is that they, they try to schedule them or try to get them directly linked to a government local health center so that, you know, they actually go back and, you know, they say like three days after you go home, you need to like go back to this place and like, they're going to check you out and, you know, make sure they're still doing okay, because that's just not something that happens, that happens um, in a standardized way. Um, so even just like something like that, like having certain patients that meet a certain risk threshold to just have a routine follow-up visit and not even necessarily a medication or something like that, I think could could change people's comfort level um, with, with sending patients home with just like watch and wait type precautions or even a community health worker visit or even a traditional healer, like incorporating some of these people that are out in the community that patients feel comfortable or have an easier time linking up with. As far as the, the antimicrobial stewardship um, in, in these settings, I think, that's the, I think that's the question that everyone is asking, and I think that's on like every provider's mind is, you know, I don't want to do harm to this child by not giving them antibiotics. I think one thing that the WHO and others are kind of trying to promote now is that giving antibiotics is also harmful. And we're starting to see more and more evidence of that. And so just kind of like people oftentimes, and I didn't either, like don't really think about that in the same way when you have a patient in front of you, because we don't necessarily see the ill effects immediately, but they're showing, you know, more and more that like, like there's a, a huge paper that just came out in the Lancet that, that talks about this, that like the actual mortality and morbidity attributed to antimicrobial resistance is off the charts, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, before we just didn't have numbers to necessarily show that, but I think it's just, it's really hard because like, I don't know, it, like practicing, practicing in this setting and like theorizing are very different. So like, I'm sure if I had a kid in front of me that, you know, had a fever and lived like an hour away from any health center, like it'd be, it'd be much more difficult to be like, sure, like don't give them anything. Like this is probably viral. So, so yeah, I think, I think all of these, all of these tools and guidelines and, you know, risk stratification, all of that are, are hopefully aimed at providing people with tools to safely do that and not have repercussions, which I think we still need more evidence to, to kind of convince people of that or demonstrate that that's, True. Thanks so much. Um, put one of the Lancet articles in the chat. Yeah, if you could link that, I have it on my computer. But... Is it Lancet Infectious Disease? Uh, I think it was in just Lancet. That's a big okay. like antimicrobial resistance one. I can look at it on here too. I'll put it out after. Anyone else? Oh, that's right. Cool. At the same time, you know, I think a lot of work is going on in antimicrobial stewardship. There's also on uh, mass drug administration, right? 
my understanding, you can make it much more than that. From my understanding is so far that doesn't seem to be. Reconcile those those two kind of approaches and efforts. If that makes sense. Like mass drug, as far as. Oh, um, so there's a at least one group. I think it's the Mormon oh, trials. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, with uh, you know there were a group of ophthalmologists, uh, GCS uh, heavily involved, that uh, were looking at ophthalmologic outcomes, but ended up finding out that I think a single dose of azithromycin twice mm -hmm. a year uh, was decreasing overall child mortality. Yeah, and there's studies on that. I think uh, I don't. I'll ask or uh, repeat this just in case people on Zoom didn't hear. But he was talking about like mass drug administration and how kind of reconciling that with um, antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial or antibiotic stewardship and um, and specifically like examples in ophthalmology where giving azithromycin kind of preventively showed that it prevents a lot of poor health outcomes or kind of increased overall child health. And I think similarly, I think there's people who study that in um, malnutrition and have found the same thing that like just giving malnourished kids whether they have infectious symptoms or not antibiotics improves their outcomes and I think I think there is definitely a place for that um, and especially you know I think these studies in malnutrition are pretty convincing but I think we need to figure out which which populations are kind of who specifically and kind of balance that with like we can't just give everyone everywhere antibiotics <laughs> but but there are certain groups that I think that that would be, you know, helpful for kind of similar to the malaria stuff, you know, like like prophylactically prophylactically treating everyone with, or specific groups of like you know under five children with anti malarials, um, you know, at some point too, like we can worry about like there are resistant strains of malaria and all of that too. So it's just like, you know, you have to do it in a way that that is um, cognizant of that and kind of reduces that risk as much as possible. And I don't know the answer. I'm sure there's like people that are working on this and epidemiologists who would have much better ways of kind of modeling that. But but yeah, I, yeah, it's hard. I don't know. Another question? I yeah, like so oh. my, name, my name is Dinah uh, and I'm from Liberia. So I work with Lasma uh, Health in a community with community health workers. So we, we have this guideline that we are following with the National Community Health Assistance Program. So it kind of raised concern for me that, I mean, from what you uh, just listening to what you have taught. And, you know, I was thinking where we have this child uh, who is between Two months, a child is just on exclusive breastfeeding. Maybe why the mother was breastfeeding and that child maybe suffered choke. Maybe the child got a full job and the child and the started to suffer choke and then maybe air or fluid went into the lungs and the child started to cough. And we have been like teaching community health workers that cough plus fast breathing, you know, equal pneumonia. So some of them based on their education level, you know, have been like treating just cough. So it has been like, I mean, listening to what you said, um, antibiotic can be harmful, you know, I mean, based on the use. So I've been thinking, um, since we are following Gala, what are where you think we can also be able to, you know, think about this and push it? Because I cannot coach a CHA from just a clinical perspective. I would know what to do as a clinician if I see your case, I might be able to investigate more. But having a community health worker, you know, following that protocol that cough plus fast breathing, you know, equals pneumonia. So because the CHA, you know, does not know that there have been something that triggered this cough and the CHA starts to administer antibiotics now, you know, fully looking at this child and investigating. What are some ways? Uh, we can work around this to make sure that, uh, like you were talking about, guidelines, you know, that we, we got no control over some of these things. I was just thinking on how can we go about some of these things um, and making sure that we push the right ideas to our community health workers. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great, a great point. Um, I think, I think, you know, the kind of the lower level, the less resources you have, the more 
cautious you have to be or kind of the more conservative you have to be. So, you know, in this, like currently, like that's kind of, you know, like you said, what the guideline is, is, is you know, based on the WHO clinical diagnosis of pneumonia is like chest and drawing, you know, cough, fever, fast breathing, like Teresa said, like without having a pulse oximeter or something to measure oxygen content, like you can't really differentiate more than that. And so I think you just have to err on the side of treating them. There are people who are studying, like actually doing point of care testing, like CRP out in the community to answer that question, um, to stratify kids to see, like, I think they're doing it with community health workers, but I can't remember. Um, it's one of the, I think it's one of the ID people in North Carolina, I want to say. Um, she has like a small, like, fashion grant for this, but they're basically looking at like adding that into that question on the ground to see if you know, that helps risk stratify patients so that you're not only using those because you can see where there's a lot of overlap. And like you said, especially in smaller children, we know that there's bronchiolitis and there's a lot of viral illnesses that, viral pneumonia that might look very similar, but it's just really hard when you don't have, when you don't have any other way and you don't want to miss the child who might have like a severe bacterial pneumonia and not give them antibiotics. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. And I put my email in the in the chat. Feel free to email me if anyone has questions or wants to be involved in any of these things or has great ideas of how to fix all these problems because I don't I don't have all those ideas. So we also put in the chat a link to the um, survey um, to or the evaluation for this session. So it's one uh, link and then you can go to the particular session we need to um, value your feedback and we take it into account every year um, so please take the time to do that it's a very short i think there's like three questions um, so thank you very much we have a uh, break now until tomorrow so for those of you who are not here in person hopefully we will see you in our future sessions starting up again tomorrow morning all right take care